everyone gradually understands what needs to be done and it gradually becomes easier to make the, the change. We don't want to use the word switch. You know, primary care networks now have the option as part of their community framework to monitor how many metered dose inhalers they use within their system. And they also have been asked now to look at whether that when they give a blue inhaler, whether it's one that has um, you know, a higher carbon footprint or a lower carbon footprint. So people are being asked to think about it now. Community pharmacists are being incentivized now to talk to patients about proper disposal of these metered dose inhalers so that they bring them back to the community pharmacy. You know, they're disposed of properly at high temperature incineration. But in the process of doing that, you're going to be talking to patients about why it's important to bring them back what the constituents are in the you know the gas canister but also at the same time there's a an incentivization to counsel patients on their inhaler therapy to make sure they can use it properly that they're you know they're being looked after and one would hope that in that process you're also talking to the patient making sure that you know their their asthma or their copd is really well looked after so it's not just an environmental issue it's a patient care issue as well we don't often give credit to the people at the top you know those who uh, make out policy and perhaps some some people think sit in their ivory towers but I think you're spot on with that and I think they have understood and they have done just generally about some other things as well that it's the system you've got to move the system and if you just do like the old styly like you just said Paul where you just did a switch for the sake of doing a switch it doesn't work and I think they've learned that and they've gone about it like you say with incentivizing both GPs and community pharmacists and trying to get people on board and our good fellows at NICE I was looking at their Jonathan Underhill will be happy but when I was looking at the NICE guidance and the patient decision aid one of the tables under how much is it important to me running from very important to not important at all is that my inhaler has a low carbon footprint that's one of the five questions that pre-consultation people get asked so that they can put across their opinion so it is that kind of pushing the system isn't it to make it happen and that's the real win isn't it when when patients start coming to us asking us for low carbon alternatives or are my medicines environmentally friendly? That's the real win in this, isn't it? And it's starting to happen. You know, I've got GP colleagues who have been approached by patients that, who specifically to sit down and talk about, you know, the environmental impact of their medicines, which is when change happens, isn't it? I mean, on that line, Tracy, I too have done a lot of reading. I've done more reading for this one than any other Me too. of the 25 episodes oh, we've done, Tracy. Gentlemen, I'm, I'm flattered. This is amazing. So I've read the 40 odd page document from The Lancet that you sent through i couldn't get all the way through that i'm sorry no, i couldn't so the lancet articles look are written with the language of an insurance claim form we know that it's a <laughs> it's a it's a tough read for the paper that we're discussing today there's a lovely pie chart which is figure four lovely <laughs> colors and that summarizes things really nicely but just as you were getting on to there and themes of this podcast over diagnosis treatment burden and they all fit into this world don't they of all the waste we put into the system ends up somewhere and then the bmj the british medical journal had a themed issue at the start of october and open on my desk now is talking to patients about the climate emergency and it's a lovely piece on how those conversations with patients need to be delicate sometimes not rushed and introducing them into those conversations and those consultations just as steve has said with you know some of the shared decision making aids it's impressive and again for you and your team and your your fellow co-founders of pharmacy declares it it must be really rewarding as well it's wonderful I you know, we actually worked with the team who wrote that article and there's been so much discussion about how to bring patients along on this journey because you know it's not just for us it's for them as well and it's for their families and the people they care about so it's a multifactorial conversation but it can be quite difficult but I think that's why health professionals are so ideally pitched to have it but in terms of health professionals taking climate action you can look at specific drugs like inhalers or devices like inhalers or um, therapeutic groups like anaesthetic acids but really you know one of the turning points for me was that I suddenly realized that medicines optimization is a sustainability process you know and if I do it properly then you know I'm all my frustrated environmentalism can be delivered through doing my my pharmacy work so all of us when we do our job really well we're all environmentalists so can we call ourselves an environmental podcast absolutely <laughs> yes please I'll, I'll put that in the hashtags <laughs> <laughs> i know we're talking about carbon but actually i'm going to bring us back to the water as well I, i've got the pharmaceutical residues in fresh water report and it just it's 
It's, it's terrifying, it's, isn't yeah, it? It's analgesics, antibiotics, anti cancer, anti diabetics, anti convulsions, anti fungals, anti histamines, beta blockers, and then psychiatry drugs um, and the impact that that has. And then I noticed on Twitter this week, Paul, there was a bit of debate, isn't there, following the episode with Diane about clarithromycin and carbamazepine don't get cleared by the. That was from a, a study in Scotland from the immediate runoff from a hospital that those type of medicines aren't getting cleared by our treatment works. It's staggering, isn't it? And there's evidence actually that when drugs go through wastewater treatment plants, sometimes not only do they not get cleared, sometimes they're activated to a, a more potent compound. So pharmacy declares have spoken to Greener NHS about this, and at the moment they're quite rightly focused on carbon. But you know this is going to be one of the next steps and one of the most important ones. But again, it comes back to you know um, great health management, making sure patients only take what they need and they know how to dispose of it properly but there's this whole new world of research that needs to be undertaken now to find out exactly what's in our water systems how it got there what effect does it have because at the moment we don't know once it's there what effect it has on all of the different organisms we don't know whether they create a cocktail once these drugs are in the water this kind of thing so this is going to be a definite area of priority importance as we go forward so we can sort of work out what's going on and how to stop it do we have any idea whether or not pharmaceutical industries are trying to change the propellant going back to paul's point about you know if you try to change all this and then actually somewhere down the line if they haven't told you and then all of a sudden i mean it will still help don't get me wrong because that is one way of doing it isn't it oh absolutely yeah no some of the pharma companies are developing less harmful propellants but they won't be around for another couple of years just to bring it back to the climate change issue we have about three to four years left to really make a dent in global climate emissions so we can't wait around for that when it comes it, it will be brilliant and it, you know we need to incorporate it into our into our formularies, but we need to act before then. Okay, thanks all. A big thank you to Tracy for joining us on the Oral Apothecary and for sharing her stories, her Desert Island Drug, her career anthem and her book for the Oral Apothecary Library. Coming up next time, we'll be joined by Lisa Green. Lisa is a medicine safety specialist. She's head of pharmacy operations for one of Europe's largest mental health charities. Lisa was also named in the Women to Watch in 2020 by the Pharmaceutical Journal. Interesting, Lisa is also a farm and animal health consultant. We will look forward to catching up with Lisa next time on the Oral Apothecary. Just just keep an eye out. There may be something for your Christmas stocking from the three apothecaries. Festive period. You never know. You can contact us via Twitter at Oral Apothecary. We're on LinkedIn and you can email us at oralapothecarypod at gmail.com. Over to Gimmo now for the final ingredient. So thanks for that, Tracy. That's fantastic. So last episode, we talked about Welsh maggots. With this episode, I'm going to talk about another insect involved in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. Do you want to hazard a guess at what it is? Leeches? No, bees. Did you know that there are beehives on the top of the Welsh School of Pharmacy? So I think most of us know that honey is known to have antibacterial properties. It's thought the particular type of bee and honey might be particularly potent in this area. And this was something that was picked up in a, what do you call it, a ivory, I don't know, in Wales. And actually, it might be something that ancient history may have a thing to teach us when it comes to antimicrobial resistance. So staff at the Welsh School of Pharmacy, working with the School of History and Archaeology and Religion, have been working together and have come up with a couple of compounds that have been shown to have activity against antibiotic resistant superbugs. And they've based this treatment on records from something called the Materia Medica, which is a medical text dating back from the first century, and the Book of Mudvai, which is an ancient Welsh medieval formulary. So it's fantastic. And to support this work, this fits in with something Tracy was saying. They've been working with Cardiff Council to make Cardiff a more friendly place for bees, with hives across the campus and I think the city, and more bee-friendly plants being planted across the city. And it's good news because they've identified two remedies which might be active against clinically relevant antibiotic resistance bacteria. There you have it, another insect to the rescue of the human race, if we can keep them alive long enough. Pharma bees. I follow them on Twitter. This was a Three Apothecaries production. Sound engineer, Jimbo Slough. Original music, Jamie Brewster. Artwork by David Baker. Thanks for listening to the Oral Apothecary podcast. Warning, may cause drowsiness if you don't listen with caffeine. This episode of the Oral Apothecary is sponsored by OneLessPill.com, a medicines optimization consultancy. Mm-hmm.